Well, good morning, everyone. We might make a start. On behalf of the State Procurement Board, welcome to what promises to be a very interesting and informative presentation and panel event. South Australian Government Procurement Former, Independent Commissioner Against Corruption and the Office of the Industry Advocate. What do they mean for procurement? We acknowledge this land we meet on today is the traditional lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. Good morning, my name's Judith Carr. I'm a member of the State Procurement Board and Executive Director Building Management in the Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure. And I'm going to be your MC for this morning's event. Um, a very warm welcome to our impressive and distinguished group of presenters. The Honourable Bruce Lander QC, the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption, Ian Nightingale, the Industry Participation Advocate, and Chris Orman, the Chair of the State Procurement Board. Welcome also to all of you, members of Senior Management Council and the Public Sector in South Australia, IPA members and partners, and stakeholders of the State Procurement Board. Now, some housekeeping items. Um, we ask that you put your phones on uh, silent now, if you haven't already. Um, there are, of course, many toilets in the building, just uh, follow out through the foyer. If there is an emergency and we need to evacuate, uh, the staff of the Convention Centre will show us the way to the exit points. Now, one important thing, um, we would appreciate it if you don't leave when people are presenting or during the panel discussion. So if you do need to leave, perhaps you'd organise to go between presentations or before the panel discussion. Um, and also, while presentations are going on, we won't be letting people in to the auditorium. Now, after presentations, there's going to be a panel discussion, which will include all the presenters. And during this, we'll be asking you whether you have any questions. Um, and we're going to have roving mics to assist you. Um, I believe you were all given a question card as you came in. So if you do have a question, you'd rather write it down rather than ask it uh, directly, please do that. And the IPA staff members will collect those cards. So then, on to our presentations. First, I'd like to introduce Chris Orman. Chris Orman is the Executive Director, Government Services Group in the Department of the Premier and Cabinet. Chris joined the Department of the Premier and Cabinet in November 2012 as the Executive Director, Government Services Group, which includes Shared Services SA, Service SA and e-Government. His role supports the development and implementation of a cohesive strategy for improving service delivery and across government public sector services. Chris has over 30 years experience in the public sector, in central and line agencies, leading corporate functions and performing senior roles in human resources management, industrial relations and organisational improvement. His committee work includes Deputy President of the Institute of Public Administration Australia, member of the Adelaide University Executive Education Advisory Board, SAPOL Audit and Risk Committee. Recently, Chris was appointed as Chair of the State Procurement Board. So let's welcome him to the stage. Well, thank you for the uh, opportunity to uh, um, uh, speak today. Um, I also acknowledge that uh, we meet on the land of the Ghana people. It's clear from the uh, attendance today that um, the issue of procurement is um, a significant issue in the sector, as it should be. When we look at um, expenditure in uh, uh, South Australian government, um, the uh, board uh, in its uh, recent annual report um, reported that there was uh, three and a half billion dollars spent on uh, goods and services. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in the uh, civil area, there is uh, significant uh, expenditure. And uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, um, also uh, purchase card uh, payments, if you include those, you'll see that uh, there is an enormous amount of uh, dollars that are, uh, are spent uh, and uh, are directly go to the uh, 
South Australian uh, community. In fact, 75% uh, of contracts um, are let to South Australian companies. Uh, and as I said, that would uh, increase significantly if you include uh, purchase card payments. Procurement uh, at the moment is uh, very topical. Um, around the world, uh, governments are looking to use um, procurement to stimulate uh, economic growth uh, within uh, their uh, areas. Um, and at the same time, uh, there's uh, pressure on public sectors to uh, reduce cost. Concurrently with that, um, following the GFC and uh, the, uh, the uh, issues uh, in economies that we're all faced with, companies are very concerned that um, they're getting a fair share of uh, government work. Today I want to explore a couple of those uh, areas um, and, uh, and I'll go through the uh, legislative framework, which um, I think is important uh, for everyone to be able to understand, uh, and then look at uh, some of the issues around uh, probity and uh, commerciality. Uh, the State Procurement Act was established as a key plank in uh, government's commitment to provide open, honest and accountable government. Uh, the board was formed as an independent body to facilitate the objects of the Act, and uh, those are not to advance government priorities and objectives by a system of procurement for public authorities directed towards firstly obtaining value in the expenditure of public monies, providing for ethical and fair treatment of participants, and ensuring probity, accountability and transparency in uh, procurement operations. Within that system, uh, the board has uh, established uh, um, probity and uh, ethical frameworks. Um, and that, uh, th those frameworks um, uh, include value for money through uh, open competitive environment and a non-discriminatory approach where suppliers are assessed on merit, uh, impartiality and objectivity at each stage of the process, about conflicts of interest um, to ensure that they're identified and managed, and accountancy, uh, accountability and uh, transparency. I said the first item uh, about um, leading towards the uh, uh, objectives, that um, one of the requirements is to advance government priorities. One of the questions that, uh, oh many, we've got a lot of questions coming to the board recently, and we are asked often, so where does uh, the uh, Office of the uh, Industry Participation Advocate fit? Why, don't, uh, why, why haven't you uh, got that in your uh, uh, policies? And we'll hear from Ian uh, later around uh, part of that. There are many policies of government. Those uh, relate to uh, um, industry, about being able to generate industry in the state, as about clean and green food. There's um, about improving transport. There are all sorts of priorities. And uh, one of the, and uh, um, about uh, encouraging local uh, business is again one of those policies. As with everything in uh, the uh, public sector, there's elements of judgment and being able to put in place the, uh, the requirements and directives and policies of uh, uh, cabinet are uh, just one of those complexities that uh, each of us needs to deal with. Um, I would add that uh, the board is currently going through the process of uh, updating a policy to uh, ensure that uh, the uh, um, industry participation um, priorities are included. So looking at um, why is probity, transparency and accountability important? Um, the application of high ethical and probity standards gives suppliers confidence to be able to participate in the market and, uh, and allows us to obtain uh, the best procurement outcomes. Probity failures, on the other hand, uh, lead us to legal challenge, public criticism, undermining of public confidence and other matters that affect uh, our reputation. 
many of those uh, can be uh, um, derived by um, um, people outside of uh, the market being uh, providing their views on life, um, and most notably those in the media. Um, and uh, we need to provide as much clarity as we can, notwithstanding the inability of uh, some of the media to report accurately around uh, our procurements. So what are some of the key aspects of the board's uh, property framework? Well, um, if we all must act ethically in accordance with the code of conduct in uh, undertaking procurement and must not accept gifts or benefits. And uh, we all are aware of the uh, toner um, cartridge uh, uh, issues that um, uh, faced uh, many of uh, the government departments recently. Um, it was not only the poor behaviour of uh, people you know, within the sector there, but it was also unscrupulous behaviour of uh, some of our suppliers, or some, some suppliers. Um, and I note that uh, those uh, same suppliers um, are back in the market at the moment. They're phoning. I know that uh, I've had uh, a couple of my staff phoned um, with uh, wonderful little offers of uh, toner. Um, I've spoken personally with uh, that company, but I know that there's another two companies out there that say, when you get back, uh, just ask uh, your staff if they're uh, engaging with them. I note that there's a, uh, a mandated uh, supply of uh, toner at the moment. The other part about uh, unscrupulous behaviour or about ethically is the issue of judgement. Whilst people may, some staff made some really bad uh, choices, I think it'd be fair to say that uh, supervisors and managers um, did likewise. Ticking a box to say that you approve uh, the procurement is not a matter of ticking a box, it's about exercising judgment. And um, um, we all exercise judgment about how our staff are performing and um, we need to be satisfied that, um, that the purchases of our staff are indeed uh, appropriate. And I think it'd be fair to say that um, some managers did not do that. Uh, suppliers must be treated equitably and fairly. Uh, rules must be clear and applied to all parties. And uh, confidential uh, information uh, must be treated as such. Um, when we talk as part of probity framework about rules must be clear, as in my role as uh, chair, I'm not at the moment, but I was chair, chaired the across government ICT procurement steering committee. And the number of suppliers that uh, spoke with me and just did not understand the fundamentals of uh, government procurement was uh, astounding. Suppliers, some of them, do not understand that mandatory means mandatory. It doesn't mean maybe. And being knocked out in the first round because it didn't uh, comply is something that was uh, a, a concern to them. Um, I believe that we have uh, an obligation to be able to work with our suppliers um, to be able to assist them to uh, understand so that their, uh, their propositions can be uh, um, well and truly uh, um, assessed on their merit. Another element of the property framework is about conflicts of interest. Um, conflicts of interest must be identified and managed. Um, at the same time, we have to be real about it. I've seen people with um, 100 shares in, uh, an in a large uh, telecommunications company saying, oh, well, because I've got these shares, I can't uh, participate in any evaluation. And indeed, that was uh, reinforced uh, some years ago. Um, it is my view that um, 100 shares in a company, of a multinational company, is not material. Um, it must be disclosed, but it is not material and should not um, um, exclude people from uh, participating. Um, that may be a bit controversial for some people, but um, we have to be real uh, in the end uh, and be, work with uh, our environment. Other areas of um, probity are about having sound risk management. 
and uh, documenting uh, activities uh, so that we are able to have a, an audit trail and uh, demonstrate the process and uh, our judgment that is being applied. Having said all that, perceptions are important. We need to not only do the right thing, but we also need to be seen to be doing the right thing. And that is uh, something that, um, again, requires judgment. And we all need to uh, be able to apply good judgment. For me, and I say it's for me, in that I know that there are some people that don't do this, um, I uh, prefer not to excel. In fact, I don't accept uh, invitations to artistic and sporting events. Um, and uh, I certainly know that uh, one person at Clipsal, there was a, a manager of mine, was taking photos of a corporate box and a person ducked for cover. They, they could see, and they saw this person taking photos. If you've got a duck for cover, that is the wrong thing to be doing. However, it is also my view that withdrawing to the safety of process and using probity as an excuse for not engaging suppliers does not meet the objectives of uh, the Act. We need to be able to balance the need to be transparent, accountable and ethical against being responsive and achieving value for money. We do need to be proactive and spend more time engaging with suppliers whilst being mindful of um, expectations. It is really important that uh, we have greater engagement to be able to understand business drivers of uh, potential suppliers. Again, referring back to my uh, ICT uh, suppliers, some of those uh, suppliers had some really innovative ideas. And I, and I spoke, I talked with them about it. I said, well, why don't you uh, raise them? And they said, well, it doesn't fit um, the specification that uh, you just had. Um, I said, have you spoken with uh, the uh, area contracting pre previously? No. And perhaps it is about, before we get into the tender period, it is about being able to spend time with our suppliers um, to be able to understand what innovation that they may bring the, uh, uh, and, and also for them to understand the uh, uh, tendering processes that uh, we go through so that they're best placed to be able to put forward something that is uh, going to be sustainable and worthwhile for them and for government as a whole. Again, um, I think I want to say is that the time for engaging suppliers, however, is not during a tender. And it's not during a tender in a corporate box at the cricket, um, which I have seen. Um, at, however, business meetings focusing on building understanding of market capacity and best practice are, the, are good practice in uh, procurement. In this, everyone must be able to hold their help head high when called to account. And uh, we certainly have uh, one of the uh, bodies that's going to uh, hold everybody to account uh, in the room. Scrutiny by media and audit and other bodies will continue and probably increase. And uh, we need to ensure that um, our behaviour is appropriate. Perhaps lastly, I just want to make a few observations about uh, commercial acumen or what uh, is often called business savvy. It is about the ability to understand your own business and your supplier's business, to be able to act in a, bus in a business like manner and to use a knowledge to think strategically and take action. Procurement strategy requires excellent information about the market. In understanding the market, we need to uh, engage with suppliers. And perhaps we need to think as a sector about how we can do that in a better way. In the ICT space, there is the um, natural resource uh, cluster, which is um, uh, looking at uh, GIS. They have come together, 
they've, they've pulled resources, they, they've been able to save dollars and increase um, uh, the uh, amount of GIS that's available for government and uh, across government. It is an excellent model and perhaps that's what we should be doing in procurement. Perhaps we can look at um, getting um, some groups together around uh, category management. Perhaps we can uh, share uh, some of the specialist uh, expertise that exists in uh, individual departments. I think that also business acumen is um, about paying closer attention to implementation and operational matters. Procurement doesn't stop when a contract is signed. Again, it's too, too easy to be able to achieve great results in the initial procurement and lose them through contract administration or contract management. Those are some areas that uh, I would like to have uh, further discussions with uh, my procurement colleagues uh, uh, with you later, um, and it'd be important for us to, to work in that area. Um, just in closing, uh, procurement is complex. It requires judgment. People in this room are able to deliver great value for uh, South Australia, and it's something that I uh, see that we want to be able to continue. And in doing so, we must do that in a way which is seen and is, and is recognised as being um, even-handed and uh, free of uh, bias. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chris, for that interesting presentation and something to ponder on there for those of us who do work in procurement each day. Now, on your behalf, I'm very pleased to invite the Honourable Bruce Lander QC, Independent Commissioner Against Corruption, to speak. Bruce Lander was admitted as a barrister and solicitor of the Supreme Court of South Australia in March 1969. He practised as a solicitor until 1981, when he signed the bar role. In 1986, he was appointed one of Her Majesty's Counsel. In November 1994, he was appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court of South Australia. He remained a judge of that court until he was appointed a judge of the Federal Court of Australia on the 14th of July 2003. In January 2004, he was appointed as additional judge of the Supreme Court of the Australian Capital Territory. In December 2008, he was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court of Norfolk Island. In November 2005, he was appointed a Deputy President of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal for a term of five years and was reappointed in 2010 for a further term. In 2013, he was appointed as the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption here in South Australia. Please welcome the Commissioner to the stage. I took office as the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption on the 1st of September when the Act commenced. There are three core objectives of the ICAC Act, only one of which needs to be considered for today's address. The Independent Commissioner Against Corruption has been created with functions designed to identify and investigate corruption in public administration and to prevent or minimise corruption, misconduct and maladministration in public administration. The functions of my office are very broad. In addition to investigating corruption, I must do the following. Assist inquiry agencies and public authorities to identify and deal with misconduct and maladministration in public administration. Give directions or guidance to inquiry agencies or public authorities. Evaluate practices, policies and procedures of inquiry agencies and public authorities. Conduct or facilitate the conducting of education programs to prevent or minimise corruption, misconduct or maladministration, and to review a legislative scheme at the request of the Attorney General. To perform those functions, I've been given very wide powers, which I'll mention shortly. There is no offence of corruption. Corruption is a generic term to describe a number of offences in the Criminal Law Consolidation Act and the Public Sector Honesty and Accountability Act. These offences include bribery, abuse of public office, and offences relating to the appointment to public office. 
as well as various offences which deal with honesty. Corruption also includes any offence committed by a public officer while the public officer is acting in his or her capacity as a public officer. So you can see that the definition of corruption is very wide. No new offence has been created though. So whatever was improper practice prior to the 31st of August this year is still improper practice and whatever was proper practice prior to my appointment is still proper practice. Misconduct occurs when a public officer contravenes a code of conduct or is involved in any other misconduct while acting in his or her official capacity. And maladministration includes irregular and unauthorised use of public money or substantial mismanagement of public resources. It can also include mismanagement in relation to the performance of official functions. It includes conduct resulting from impropriety, incompetence or negligence. Now, all three of those types of conduct are relevant in relation to procurement. The Procurement Act defines procurement operations in relation to a public authority to mean the procurement of goods or services required by a public authority for the operations, the management of goods of a public authority, including the care, custody, storage, inspection, stock taking or distribution of goods of a public authority, the management of a public authority's contracts for services, or the disposal of good, goods surplus to a public authority's requirements. The concept of procurement, therefore, extends far beyond purchasing and choosing a supplier. Procurements are not limited to purchasing goods or services, but in respect of goods may include the leasing, the hiring, and even the borrowing of goods. Procurement includes the managing of goods of a public authority, irrespective of how the authority has come to possess those goods. It also includes the management of contracts for services that would involve evaluating services that have been supplied to ensure that they meet the standards provided by the service agreement. It also includes the finalisation of a contract and disposing of surplus goods. The procurement operations, as the Act calls it, is inher inherently presents a number of risks which is the reason, of course, for the Procurement Act and for the Procurement Board, both of which exist to manage those risks. There is a risk that public officers will act where they have a conflict of interest and abuse their position of power. Significant amounts of money are expended that accentuates those risks. In its last annual report, the Procurement Board reported that, public, that the public authorities that are required to report to the Board spent a total of 3.97 billion on goods and services for the financial year ending 2013. It's therefore of the utmost importance that public authorities do all they can to minimise uh, the risks involved in the procurement process. The State Procurement Board, as Chris has said, uh, was established by the Procurement Act and was established to replace the State Supply Board. It is an agency of the Crown the Board has very wide functions. Section 3 of the Procurement Act identifies the, ob the object of that Act, which is to advance government priorities and objectives by a system of, of procurement for public authorities directed towards, and Chris has already mentioned this, obtaining value in the expenditure of public money and providing for ethical and fair treatment of participants and ensuring probity, accountability and transparency in procurement operations. It's the last stated objective that uh, I, in my role as independent commissioner against corruption, will be most concerned. This is where the work of the procurement board and my office is likely to intersect. If there is a lack of probity, accountability or transparency in procurement operations by a public authority, this may give rise to a potential issue of corruption, misconduct or maladministration as defined in the Act, the ICAC Act. The ICAC Act um, reaches out to all public authorities identified in Schedule 1 of the Act. The definition of public authority in the Procurement Act is different to and not as wide as the definition of public authority in the ICAC Act. Whether that will mean that some public authorities that are answerable under the ICAC Act are not caught by the Procurement Act might need to be determined. Section 19 of the Procurement Act 
requires all public authorities to comply with the policies, principles, guidelines, standards, issue are given by the board and any other direction <coughs> given by the responsible minister on the advice or recommendation of the board. Section 20 provides that the principal officer of a public authority is responsible for the efficient and cost-effective management of procurement operations of the authority. In March 2013, the board published its most recent version of its procurement policy framework, which sets out the overarching policy for the operations of procurement in the Government of South Australia. That policy framework has to be understood having regard to the requirements of the Procurement Act, the board's purposes and functions, and its policies and guidelines. It applies to all public authorities as identified in that Act, but not local government or universities. There are five subjects in the board's policies and guidelines, and they relate to governance, reporting, requirements, context, and process. Public authorities also need to be aware of the board's published market approach guidelines and probity and ethical procurement guidelines. Time doesn't allow this morning for a discussion of those documents, all of which necessarily descend into considerable detail. The failure of a public authority and its principal officer to comply with the policies, principles, guidelines and standards of the board or the responsible minister will ordinarily be relevant to an assessment that a matter raises a potential issue of misconduct or maladministration. Indeed, the failure may of itself amount to misconduct or maladministration. I'd encourage all, princi principal, all public authorities to revisit all of the board's policies, principles, guidelines, standards and directions to ensure that their authorities' procurement practices comply with those policies. There are several specific criminal offences that can be categorised as corruption under the ICAC Act that might occur at any stage of a procurement operation. It might be said that these offences that come within the definition of corruption <coughs> excuse me, will be dealt with in the ordinary way by the criminal justice system commencing with a police investigation. That's how it was before the ICAC Act was passed. But that's no longer how it is. If a public officer now engages in conduct that is a criminal offence of the kind that is recognised as corruption under the ICAC Act, I will have the responsibility of investigating that conduct. And in investigating that conduct, I have coercive powers that the police don't possess. Because of these powers, <coughs> because of these powers it is likely that offences that constitute corruption will be more likely to be de detected. Public officers in South Australia should be aware of the significant change that has been brought about by the creation of my office. <coughs> Excuse me. Part 5 of the Criminal Law Consolidation Act prescribes offences relating to public office that constitute corruption. Section 249 deals with bribery and Section 251 deals with the offence of abuse of public office. These offences encompass the public's common conception of what would amount to corruption. The risk of a public officer being bribed or abusing the public officer's office during the procurement operation is undeniable. Where a public authority lets out a contract for tender, the procurement operation is likely to become extremely competitive and let tenderers may seek to do everything they can, legally or illegally, to obtain an advantage over the other tenderers. Similarly, public officers enjoy a degree of power when deciding whether a contract should be let out for tender or when deciding to choose one supplier over another. Public officers will be confronted with temptations that raise serious ethical questions throughout all stages of the procurement process. There are three elements that are common to the two offences which I've described. Firstly, acting improperly. Secondly, the offering of or seeking or accepting a benefit and the exercise of a power or influence. The notion of acting improperly is defined in section 238 of the Criminal Law Consolidation Act. It applies to a public officer and a person who acts in relation to or deals with a public officer. A public officer or that person acts improperly if he or she knowingly or recklessly acts contrary to the standards of propriety that are generally and reasonably expected by ordinary decent members of the community to be observed by public officers. Therefore, what is said to be improper is to be assessed with regard to reasonable contemporary standards. 
It's necessary to consider the role and position of the public officer or that person when determining whether their conduct can, said to be, can be said to be improper. This is, particularly, this is a particularly important consideration in the context of the pr procurement operation. The procurement of goods or services of significant value might ordinarily involve a number of persons. Public authorities should ensure that each person's role in a procurement operation is clearly defined and articulated at a very early stage in the process. It will assist my office to know the role each person played during a procurement operation in order to determine whether that person acted improperly. For example, if the alleged conduct was outside the scope of that of their identified role in the procurement process, that may indicate that that person has acted improperly. The second element common to both offences is bribery, it is benefit. Part seven of the, of the uh, Criminal Law Consolidation Act does not define this term. A benefit takes on its ordinary meaning and is not to be construed narrowly. The benefit that most readily comes to mind, of course, is monetary uh, uh, benefit. It'd be naive, however, to think that that's the only benefit that a public officer might obtain if acting improperly. A benefit could uh, be in many different forms that result in a positive circumstance by placing that person in a better position. I'll give an uh, example. During a, um, a tender process, a tender offered the chief executive officer of the public authority a position on the board of a subsidiary company of the tenderer when the chief executive officer retired from his or her public office in return for being awarded the contract. The position on that board is a benefit to the chief executive officer. Another example is after a tender process, the successful tenderer offers the CEO of the public authority tickets to all the Crows games at Adelaide Oval as a gift for the tenderer being awarded the contract. The season's tickets are a benefit to that chief executive officer. Benefits extend to gifts, however small or insignificant they might be. Gifts undoubtedly influence a person's decision making, even if be subconscious. In its 2011 report on corruption risks in New South Wales, government procurement, the New South Wales um, ICAC reported that a particular supplier told the Commission that its sales representatives were trained to offer small novelty items to public officers. The rationale for the offer was that, the, that people felt psychologically indebted to the sales representative if they accepted those items and are therefore more likely to buy the sales representative products. That uh, conduct by those sales representat representatives is grooming and it's unacceptable and can't be tolerated. We talk of grooming often in the criminal law when we speak of uh, people um, taking advantage of children by grooming them, but this is the same sort of conduct. It's, it's conduct of a kind which is likely, which is in, intended to lead to uh, a corrupt result. Um, Chris has already mentioned toner cartridges. Can I mention the, uh, the report of the um, Victorian Ombuds Ombudsman in relation to that in 2011? Over four years, a project officer employed by Arts Victoria purchased 129 toner cartridges. As a result, the majority of the cartridges would necessarily be wasted. The project officer made these purchases so that she could obtain gift cards given by the supplier to those who placed orders with them. Over the four years, she received gifts to the extent of $8,300, and the department was put to a cost of $80,000 in purchasing toners that could not be used. The Victorian Ombudsman discovered that there was an accepted culture at Arts Victoria of staff receiving gifts and benefits in the form that um, this particular officer had received them and also in the form of fr free tickets to art shows including operas, theatres and ballets. Although the department had a clear policy prohibiting staff from accepting any gift or benefit from people or organisations with whom staff might make decisions involving procurement and the department maintained a gift register, that register did not contain any record of any gift for the whole of the nine month period over which some of the officer's conduct allegedly occurred. The culture within the department clearly influenced the uh, officer's behaviour. I've already been approached by um, three separate organisations who deal with um, local government and they've expressed their concern at the local government's reaction to the creation of my office. I've been told that a significant number of persons in local government are refusing to accept gifts 
free meals and entertainment. And I think the, um, the reason that I was contacted to be told this was that uh, they held me responsible for their, the uh, local government officer's conduct. I hope it is me that is responsible for that because that sense, that culture which exists in local government has to change. It's no longer permissible to obtain gifts or benefits of the kind that people in local government have been accustomed to receive. Although I'd like to take credit for the change in uh, conduct, it's not entirely due to me. Uh, on the uh, 29th of August 2013, the local government introduced a code of con conduct that applies to members of council in anticipation of me commencing my uh, functions on the 1st of September. And that code of contract addressed uh, gifts and benefits in some detail. Those involved in local government, and that will include not only members, but soon to be, uh, uh, because of a soon to be introduced code of conduct relating, relating to um, uh, council employees, uh, they have to accept that the culture of receiving gifts and benefits uh, is no longer appropriate. The third element uh, common to the two offences to which I've referred is the exercise of power or influence a public officer has by virtue of being a public officer. Public officers involved in a procurement operation possess, for the time being, a significant amount of power. This extends uh, in, to public officers who make the ultimate decisions about whether a contract is awarded to one tenderer over another, and to public officers who merely have access to information relating to the procurement of goods or services. For the purpose of these offences, the two offences to which I referred, it is not a requirement that that person have a significant power or influence. It is sufficient that if the source of the power or influence is derived from the person's position as a public officer. There are other offences that um, are likely to be committed in the procurement process. Section 140 of the Criminal Law Consolidation Act makes it an offence for, for a person to dishonestly deal with a document. The circumstances in which a person might dishonestly deal with a document includes creating a document that is false, falsify an existing document, possessing, producing, publishing or using a document knowing it to be false, or destroying, concealing or suppressing a document. If that person is a public officer and is dishonestly dealing with a document in his or her capacity as a public officer in order to deceive or exploit the ignorance of another, to benefit himself or herself or another person or, or to cause detriment to another, then that constitutes an offence which constitutes corruption against public administration. You're all familiar with the amount of documents that uh, can be generated in the procurement operation. They're created by a number of different parties to the uh, operation. Proper record keeping and documentation throughout the proc procurement process is crucial in ensuring the transparency of the process. Procurement documents should not be created for the, sim for the sake simply of creating a document. The documents must be meaningful and relevant. Public officers must understand what is to be included in a procurement docu document and who has the responsibility to complete the documentation. A case that points out the importance of meaningful documents was identified by the New South Wales ICAC in its 2011 report. The Commission investigated the conduct of a person who posed as a researcher that resulted in two hospitals losing almost $70,000, $700,000. The researcher had convinced clinical and administrative staff at the hospitals that she was a postgraduate university student undertaking clinical trials on the use of a new device as part of her medical research. She was neither a postgraduate student nor a researcher. She prepared requisitions and orders that falsely purported to be signed by various doctors in order to, ensure, to procure payment to three companies controlled by her and her sister. The services purported to be related to the clinical trial, but no work was ever performed. The researcher was able to succeed in having these invoices paid because it was all, almost impossible for the accounts payable clerks to check that every single invoice was appropriately signed by a person with the, co the correct financial work delegation. The clerks could not possibly know what the signature of all those with delegation looked like or the names of the managers or doctors. So they simply look for scrawl at the bottom of the piece of paper. If a public officer commits an act of theft while acting in his or her capacity as a public officer, that offence would con constitute corruption for the purpose of the ICAC Act. There is a relatively high risk of theft in the procurement process. 
An example is where a public officer who is responsible for receiving goods from a supplier dishonestly records that less goods were received than were in fact delivered, so that he or she can steal the goods not recorded. I've already mentioned the Public Sector Honesty and Accountability Act. Section 26 of that uh, Act requires all public sector employees to act honestly at all times in the performance of their duties. A failure to act honestly amounts to corruption for the purpose of the ICAC Act. The conduct involved must not be merely of a trivial, trivial character and must have resulted in significant detriment to the public interest. The terms used in this offence provision are not defined in the Honesty and Accountability Act. What am might amount to a failure to act honestly will depend upon the particular facts and circumstances of each case and whether the impugned conduct falls short of the standards of honesty and accountability that the com community would, would ordinarily expect. A failure to act honestly might occur at any stage of the procurement process. For example, if a public officer knowingly misleads a particular tenderer or where a public officer discloses confidential information to another tenderer to give that tenderer a competitive advantage, that will be a failing, failure to act honestly. Unlike the offences of bribery, which I've mentioned, and, uh, and uh, abuse of public office, a benefit uh, to a person is not an element of this offence. The key element for this offence is whether the conduct resulted in significant detriment to the public interest. The position of contractors should be addressed. Although the function of the Procurement Board does not appear to extend to scrutinising the conduct of contractors, my jurisdiction does extend to those persons. Schedule 1 of the ICAC Act um, identifies public officers and public authorities responsible for those officers to whom the Act applies. A person performing contract work with an agency or with the Crown is a public officer for the purpose of the ICAC Act. Contract work is defined in Section 4 of the Act as work performed by a person as a contractor or an employee of a contractor or otherwise directly or indirectly on behalf of a contractor. If the work is performed for a public authority, then that public authority is responsible for the contractor. The important thing is for the ICAC Act, a contractor is a public officer and therefore within the remit of the ICAC Act. Section 29 of the Honesty and Accountability Act requires persons performing contract work to act honestly at all times in the performance of the contract. Section 30 of the same Act requires persons performing contract work to disclose all potential and actual conflicts of interest to the authority with which they are contracted. These offences will be corruption under the ICAC Act. If a public authority or public officer reasonably suspects a contractor to have engaged in conduct in breach of these provisions, the authority or the officer is obliged to report that to the Office for Public Integrity, which is the other office which I head. Can we just address briefly procurement misconduct? The Public Sector Code of Ethics, to which Chris earlier referred, mentions one particular type of procurement misconduct that I'd like to draw to your attention. The Code of Ethics prohibits a public sector employee engaging in outside employment where that employment potentially or actually conflicts with the public sector employee's work as a public sector employee. This section of the code also requires public sector employees who leave the public sector to work with a non-government employer to avoid situations which would result in an unfair advantage with the new employer. The code then specifically exemplifies the, the case where the non-government employer is bidding for a government contract or is competing for a grant or similar disbursement of public money. I note that the Procurement Board's standard bidding rules require that the suppliers identify actual or potential conflicts of interest, presumably at the point of a supplier makes it its bid for the contract. Sections 29 and section 30 of the Honesty and Accountability Act deal more specifically with conflicts of interest at the point where tenderers actually become suppliers. I'd encourage all public authorities to identify any conflict of interest or unfair or improper advantage a tenderer might have at the point of the bid being entered. That will assist in stamping out corruption at the beginning of the process. There are six stages in a procurement process. The first is identifying the need. This requires a proper analysis of precisely what is needed, why it is needed, and when it is needed. Public authorities should also give some attention 
as to the person within the agency who is, to, who is responsible for identifying the need. The uh, cartridge toner case is um, an example of that. However, in the 2011 report again, uh, the New South Wales ICAC identified that at one local council, the lowest paid employee, who was a storeman, was responsible for 60% of the value of the council's procurements, excluding all capital works uh, expenditure. If there was only one person in an authority charged with identifying the agency's need, the agency is exposed to the risk that the agency needs might be tailored to what one person's associates can provide. Further, as the New South Wales ICAP uh, report states, if corruption at this very early stage is not detected, the rest of the procurement can follow process and appear compliant when in fact the whole process was corrupt from the very start. The procurement process must be created upon a real need basis, not simply a it would be nice to have basis. Sometimes a special need or an emergency requirement is used to justify adopting a single stage approach or negotiating directly with just one supplier. Public authorities should guard against the false creation of a special need or emergency by identifying the criteria to be satisfied in order for a need to be considered special or urgent. Another mechanism might involve a review by a senior officer who has the responsibility of independently assessing whether a need is special or urgent. The second stage is how to get what is needed. The Procurement Board and its market approach guidelines outline several methods by which a public authority might obtain goods and services from the market. I'd like to mention briefly the single stage approach and direct negotiation. The Board and its guidelines appropriately identifies that a single stage approach carries an increased risk in relation to unethical practices or conflicts of interest. Direct negotiations give public officers greater opportunity to engage in corrupt conduct by, for example, giving a supplier additional work in the hope of a kickback, splitting an excessive profit margin, or obtaining work for a favoured subcontractor. I've no difficulty in accepting that uh, there may be instances where it is appropriate for a public authority to approach only one particular supplier. Indeed, in the, bo the board's last annual report, the board noted that 37.4% of contracts valued at over $110,000 were negotiated directly with one supplier. A public authority should, however, ensure that where a single stage market approach is adopted, it is well placed to support the procurement decision with clear and comprehensive uh, evidence. My office may need to carefully consider a public authority's decision to negotiate directly with a single supplier, and any evidence supporting the need for the single market approval will assist in such consideration. Transparency is, of course, the key for this type of process. In relation to letting out a contract for tender, a public authority should be vigilant in ensuring its officers do not have the opportunity to stage a failed tender. In its 2006 report, the ABD OECD Anti-Corruption Initiative Razor and Pacific identified examples of this process by a corrupt public officer setting inadequate bidding conditions, including short or unrealistic unre bidding periods, or unrealistic or contradictory requirements, specifications or budgets or by insufficiently publishing the bid opening. False tender failure can be addressed by ensuring the tender is made known to the wider number of suppliers as possible. As the report notes, a higher number of bidders diminishes the risk of collusive bidding cartels, as well as reducing opportunities for favouritism and nepotism. Publishing a tender wide, widely therefore assists in averting corrupt practices. The third stage is choosing the supplier it is important to have a detailed knowledge of the supplier who is to become the contractor. A public authority must, by due diligence, ensure that it is aware of exactly with whom the public authority is contracting, which will reduce the risk of corruption. There are two good reasons for that. First, having a solid understanding of a supplier will allow a proper assessment as to whether the supplier can deliver on the contract in the terms of the contract. If a supplier submits a low bid and a tender process, it may be because it does not have, in fact have the ability to meet all of the terms of the contract, but is thereby pretending that it can. Referee checks may uncover any inabilities of the supplier. Secondly, knowing exactly who is supplying the goods or services will assist in identifying any hidden associations and any conflicts of interest. A supplier can be apparently independent, but be no more than a front for a public officer, 
uh, in charge of the tenderer tendering process. It's therefore necessary to know the structure of the tenderer, including sometimes its directors and secretaries, and often its ultimate beneficiaries. A public authority needs to know who is entitled to the benefit of the contract into which the authority intends to enter. Experience shows that procurement officers do award contracts to entities that are in fact fronts for relatives and friends and which pay the procurement officers for the benefits bestowed. The fourth stage is sealing the deal. This stage involves careful draft, careful, carefully drafting the terms of the contract and a contract management plan. This assists in, in informing the later stage of the pro, procurement process. The subject matter of the procurement, i.e. what is to be supplied, the how, the when and to whom it's supplied should be pre precisely identified in respect of all procurements. The terms and conditions of the contract must be clear and free of ambiguities. If the contractual arrangements are loose or vague, the opportunity for a person to take advantage about what, when and at what cost it is supplied will be increased. It, it almost goes without saying that no procurement should be pursued unless it be at the cost of a few dollars without a clear documentary evidence of the terms relating to the procurement. The next stage is identifying whether or not you've got what you paid for. Verifying delivery is crucial. There are obvious reasons why a public authority should know exactly what it is provided and comparing that which has been provided with what was agreed to be provided. I'll give another example from New South Wales. I suppose it would be inappropriate to uh, observe that New South Wales seems to be able to provide as many examples of, as one needs. In 2004, the New South Wales ICAT investigated a regulatory agency which was responsible for certifying operators of heavy machinery and plant and equipment and which had outsourced the competency assessment to another party. The investigation revealed that six assessors issued tens of thousands of notices of satisfactory assessments without having properly conducted an assessment. In some cases, no assessment was ever carried out. The assessors were being bribed to issue competency notices. The audits carried out by the reg regulatory agency had failed to identify almost all in instances of the corrupt conduct. There were no proper mechanisms of quality control to valid validate to validate the claims of competency made by the outsourced agency. Therefore, the regulatory agency had no way of actually knowing it was whether it was getting that for which it paid. And that leads me to the, the final stage of the procurement process. Did you get what you paid for and what do you do with the surplus? At the end of every contract, especially a contract of significant value, it is necessary to determine whether the agency has received what in fact it identified it needed. A proper procurement process requires a responsible person to certify that the five stages of the process have been complied with and the sixth stage to certify that the authority has now received on time, at the agreed price, from the supplier with which it contracted, what the authority had ordered, which was what the authority identified it needed. Not only does that certification provide a rough audit, it is a useful history of the public authority dealing with that supplier. If the public authority cannot tick all the boxes, the public authority should examine both its own performance and that of the supplier. If surplus goods have been provided for whatever reason, these must be disposed of appropriately and at as, and as at little cost to the public authority as possible. An asset disposal schedule should be a part of a thorough audit process for this final stage. The Queensland Crime and Misconduct Commission identifies five major risks in the procurement process. The first is uh, the one to which Chris referred, lack of accountability and transparency mechanisms. It is a major risk that might infect all stages of procurement. A public authority must have in place proper and meaningful mechanisms that will reveal any corrupt activity. This will involve creating a strong paper trail because a paper trail often reveals dishonest activities. In other instances, an accountable process will require more than one person being involved in each stage of the process. The second major risk is conflict, uh, conflicts of interest. They can occur at any stage of the procurement process. Conflicts can arise in many diverse ways. A friend or family member who becomes a beneficiary of the government contract is one way. Where there is an actual or potential conflict of interest, 
it is important that public authorities know that they're required to disclose that in conflict and, in fact, disclose the, contact, the conflict. The responsibility is upon senior officers of an agency to create a culture of disclosure and to ensure all public officers are aware of what interests might conflict or be perceived for conflict with their work as public officers. The instance that Chris gave of um, a public officer having 100 shares or 1,000 shares in um, a major international company is an instance where that public officer must disclose the ownership of those shares. But I agree with him, the ownership of that sh those shares would not be a reason for the public officer not being able to perform his or her duties in relation to a procurement process which involved that other company. Public officers and suppliers can develop, uh, the, the, sorry, the third risk is perceived favouritism. Public officers and uh, suppliers can develop close associations over a period of time simply by working together. The development of close working relationships is natural, but those rela relationships cannot be allowed to interfere with or be seen to interfere with the, the procurement process. In order to minimise this particular risk, uh, public authorities should treat all suppliers or tenderers fairly and equally. This will involve in communicating with each supplier in the same way by giving each supplier the same material advice and timelines. It will also involve using the same process of offers and evaluation. Any deviation from standard practices should be needed to be justified. It also means that those with procurement responsibilities might need to be routinely moved from their position so that new persons are introduced to old suppliers. Integrity of suppliers. The risk of contracting with an unethical or corrupt supplier is high. Unethical suppliers will attempt to influence the procurement process to gain an unfair advantage. They might collude with other suppliers or make false and multiple bids under different business names. The conduct is very hard to detect. However, public officers need to be trained to identify such behaviour by generating what I would call a culture of curiosity in relation to suppliers. Public authorities should learn as much as possible about the suppliers to build up an internal database of suppliers or potential suppliers. A public authority will then have the ability to track a supplier's performance over time and will be able to detect any changes in the supplier's performance that might suggest untoward behaviour. And the last uh, risk, uh, major risk identified by uh, the Queensland CMC is, relates to gifts and benefits. Generating a culture and creating an expectation that all employees should refuse gifts and benefits, no matter how insignificant, is the only way to effectively prevent this risk. It avoids what I'd earlier described as grooming, which is an, an incipient risk. Can I just mention now the reporting obligations under the ICAC Act, which apply to all public authorities and public officers, of which you all, you all are. The ICAC Act required me on the 1st of September to uh, publish what are called direction and guidelines uh, indicating the reporting obligations for uh, public authorities and public officers. The, uh, rep the um, direction and guidelines were published on, the, um, on ICAC's website on the uh, 1st of September. They require um, all inquiry agencies, which is the Ombudsman, Police Ombudsman or Commissioner for Public Sector Employment, all public authorities and all public officers to report conduct that they reasonably suspect involves corruption, misconduct or maladministration in public administration. There is no exception in relation to corruption. All public officers have to report any conduct that they reasonably suspect involves corruption. I've tried to explain in the direction of the guidelines, which are on the website, what is meant by the term reasonably suspects or forming a reasonable suspicion. Those directions and guidelines specify the map, the, what I think those two um, phrases mean. A suspicion is something short of belief, but it must um, uh, rely on some fact. The Act, um, as I say, requires um, public officers to report all matters of corruption, even if that public officer knows that the matter has previously been reported to the Office for Public Integrity. It would be misconduct for a public officer to fail to report to the Office for Public Integrity 
conduct that that officer reasonably suspects involves corrupt, corruption, miscon a serious misconduct, a serious or systemic misconduct, and serious and or systemic maladministration. The effect of the directions and guidelines is to make it mandatory for inquiry agencies, public authorities and public officers to report all conduct that occurred after the 1st of September 2013 that those persons reasonably suspect involves corruption. The directions and guidelines permit public authorities and public officers to report any conduct prior to the 1st of September 2013 if they, again, reasonably suspect that conduct amounts to uh, corruption or serious or systemic misconduct or serious or systemic maladministration. The intent of the directions and guidelines is that the Office of Public Integrity, which is the repository of all um, reports, will have uh, within its organisation notification of all conduct of the kind which I'm called upon to investigate. The end result is that uh, if all public authorities and public officers comply with the reporting obligations, the Office of Public Integrity should be aware of all conduct that is reasonably suspected to be corruption or serious and systemic misconduct or maladministration within the state, including conduct of that kind at local government level. The obligation uh, to report also includes the obligation to self-report. If a public authority reason or a public officer reasonably suspects that it was or he or she, or someone has engaged in corruption or misconduct or maladministration, which it, uh, and in the last two cases, which is serious or systemic, the uh, public authority or person must report that conduct to the Office for Public Integrity. I'm not expecting many people to self-report, <laughs> but I am expecting public authorities to self-report. Uh, it would be consistent with the public authority's duty to the public to self-report if the public authority became uh, uh, became aware that people within its organisation had been guilty of corruption, misconduct or maladministration. A closer reading of um, the directions and guidelines will show that uh, there are some exceptions to the mandatory reporting obligations. For example, the Director of Public Prosecutions is not under a, um, an obligation to report corruption, misconduct or maladministration that he becomes aware of in the uh, conduct of, of his office. He, of course, would be while when prosecuting a public officer or someone connected with a public officer for any of the offences under the Criminal Law Consolidation Act become aware that that was corruption, misconduct or maladministration. He's not under an obligation to report that. The Procurement Board is a public authority and is therefore bound by the direction and guidelines that I've issued pursuant to Section 20 of the ICAC Act in accordance with Section 10 of the Directions and Guidelines. The Procurement Board is therefore required to report to the Office for Public Integrity any matter that the Board reasonably suspects involves corruption in public administration. The Board is also required to report to the Office for Public Integrity any matter, matter that the Board reasonably suspects may involve serious or systemic misconduct or maladministration in public administration unless it knows the matter has already been reported to an inquiry agency. I expect all public authorities to comply with the directions and guidelines. I expect all public officers also to comply with the directions and guidelines. If it becomes known to me that a public authority has failed to comply with the directions and guidelines, I'll report as much to Parliament. Can I raise one matter of concern? During um, investigations that have been carried out by my investigators, uh, they've been often asked by public officers who and what is the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption? That's concerning, especially when the question is asked by senior or middle management. All public officers should be aware of the existence of my office and the Office for Public Integrity. If they have not been made aware, that seems to me to be the fault of the public authority which employs them. There are two consequences if uh, public officers are not aware of my office. First, the deterrent effect of the office will be lost. There is a deterrent effect by appointing someone as the Independent Commissioner Against Corruption. But secondly, and more importantly, they can't know what their reporting obligations are if they've never heard of the office to which the report has to be made. I've not said anything about ed education. The most cost-effective way of dealing with corruption, misconduct and maladministration is by preventing the conduct. 
Education is the most effective way of implementing a culture which embraces prevention. It is one of my duties to minimise corruption, misconduct and maladministration by educating those people in public administration. I'll deal with uh, IPA and the Procurement Board to establish educational programs to assist those involved in public administration to develop ethical and moral standards in the procurement process that makes for good governance. I'd like to finish um, by briefly mentioning the concept of probity. The Australian Concise Oxford Dictionary defines probity to mean uprightness and honesty. In the context of the procurement practices of public authorities, this largely translates into transparency. The public must have confidence in the operation of its government. In turn, the government must do all it reasonably can to ensure it enjoys the highest level of public confidence. This requires all organs of government to be able to explain their operations, especially operations that involve substantial expenditure of public monies. This is part of what my office will hopefully achieve. Greater level of public confidence in procurement practices by identifying and dealing with such practices where they might raise issues of corruption, misconduct or maladministration. In order to achieve the highest level of probity in public administration, I urge all public authorities to consider the culture within its own organisation, which is largely informed by the quality of its management and the morality of its senior staff. Statements of policies are important, but more important is the carrying out of those policies. Managers and senior public officers have a crucial role to play in that regard. The effect of leading by example cannot be underestimated. Thank you for listening. <laughs>